Welcome in, everybody, to another edition of Kicking It. Uh, we have a very special guest today. This one is uh, from the Worldwide Leader out there in Bristol, Connecticut. Uh, as always, we are brought to you by Kelderman Manufacturing. Uh, we are only a few short weeks away from football starting. So if you want something to go with your tailgate setup and you want something custom, whether it's laser engraved, laser cut, whatever, Kelderman.com. Uh, as always, I'm Jeff Woody, and I'm here with Grant Mahoney. Uh, any B updates? Do you have any uh, B updates? Yeah, dude. Um, well, not necessarily an update. I, I am extracting. I mean, the same thing I said last time. I'm extracting honey, honey yep, from uh, the Ankeny hives on the 24th and then Indianola hives um, at the end of the month, beginning of September. So usually the first year of, of a hive, you won't get any honey um, just because the bees have to build out the comb. and then they fill, have to, fill But they the also comb. have to build relationships with each other. They need a, well, they need a postman. They're sisters. They need so. uh, teachers. They need firefighters. Self -taught. They're self -taught. They, just, they need they need a community. So I've, I've got the Indianola. Uh, I'll probably have about uh, 60 pounds, which is one five-gallon bucket from Indianola and that I'll extract at the end of August, beginning of September. I tried some of the honey uh, a couple weeks ago. It tastes like bubblegum. Kind of wild. Interesting. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. So that, that's all I got for a B update. I'll know more in a couple of weeks. We have, uh, I, I don't really have it. I guess the only update that I, just as an, a random non sequitur story, uh, there was a, an incident where, have you ever had done one of these things? And like, I, I, my, my dad was a farmer, went to construction. I kind of just have always been around just building stuff. Um, and this is in the, usually in the building stuff range, but it also can happen in any other situation. When you do something that's so stupid that you can't even be mad because you know in the moment that you're doing it, it's stupid. So I have these, uh, uh, I, on, on the video, you can see on the, on a, I peeled my fingernail back and I have a cut on my knuckle mm. from doing something really, really stupid. And in the moment, I was trying to tap, uh, I cut a sheet of plywood, I was trying to tap it into the place where it actually needed to fit. And like, rather than using you use your hand, you want to use a block of wood, going to spread the load out. And usually what you want to do is just hold that block of wood up and use a mallet to kind of tap it in. I said, no, 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 I can handle this. And just took the actual block of wood and was just smacking it like a caveman to try and get it in position, uh, in the process of doing it, swinging it down one time, uh, yeah, peeled my fingernail back and scratched my finger. Uh, and midway through the swing, I brother, was like, ugh. Yeah. brother, ugh. what is that? This, it was midway through the swing where it was, I realized that it was the stupidest thing that I could do. And there was a hammer four feet away from me to actually use to hit it. Uh, so I just wanted to share that, that instance, because I know that I'm not the only one, whether it's building something or otherwise, that in the midst of doing something, you realize it's dumb. And then it ends up exactly as dumb as you think. So you can't even be mad because it was as stupid as you wanted. And then like karma's just like, you're dumb. I'm gonna hurt your finger. You don't mind. I don't know if that was Aiden. You ever had one of those instances? No, I'm the smartest man alive. Thanks. Oh, that's fair. Oh, well, it's understandable. No, I have four or five of those moments a day. Probably. <laughs> God bless it. I, I, something will happen. I just go, sure. Yep. Yep. That's on me. That one's on me. I made that mistake. I'm going to own that. I'm going to work to be better. Become the best version of myself. Aiden usually just finds the nearest mirror, looks at himself, and just gives himself a thumbs down. And then proceeds yep, exactly. With the day. <laughs> I'm just going with my day. Proceeds with the day. <laughs> oh, that's looks a, at man in the mirror. That's that is a that's a callback. When did we talk? When was that? The the traffic story was that this summer? Or was that last football season? I think it was basketball season. It was basketball season. Man, yeah. that's a that's thumbs a callback. Yeah. Thumbs down. I've I've I've, uh, I've received a couple middle fingers really for no reason. I I, I I've had some bad road rage. These particular instances. Road rage. Uh, road. Oh, yeah, Royd. I'm not that jacked. Yeah, thank you though. Uh, I've had some. I know if I have road rage, and I don't. Uh, I used to. I would say I used to. Um, just you know, just grumpy. The other day I was on my way to golf league, and some lady wanted to cut over, and I was going you know faster than she was. And as I drove by her, she just I, I saw her middle finger. I was like, what the heck is that about? So I slowed down, didn't look at her, just gave her the. As I drove by her, just solid it's, thumbs down. She probably felt disappointed in yeah. herself. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure she saw. I didn't look though, but I just, you know, no eye contact, just thumbs like, down. Yeah, thumb don't lady. flip somebody off because flipping somebody off is an anger response. And I'm sure she's probably like, what the hell is that? A thumbs, down, thumbs down in traffic is just, I'm disappointed. I expected better from you. Did you just thumbs down my text? Yeah, that's what I did. Uh, we're not going to thumbs down our guest though. No. This is uh, ESPN. I mean, we, we got a list of the stuff that he does through ESPN. I mean, it's just the list is long. Uh, so we're just going to say it's ESPN's Matt Berry. He's a college football national guy who hosts with, uh, I mean, basically everybody's Dan Mullen, Joey Galloway. I mean, it's terrific. And he's a ASU alum. So uh, without any further ado, 
It's Matt Barry of ESPN. All right, and now we welcome in Matt Barry, Sports Center anchor and college football studio host with ESPN. Matt, thank you for uh, taking the time to talk with us today. Guys, anytime we're what two weeks away from the start of the beautiful season. So anytime I can get on and, and talk college ball with, with people, it's it's my pleasure. It's my favorite time of year. Yeah, I, I I feel like we are the, the connection that was because Chris Hassel is a friend of the program. Yeah. And you you and Chris worked together a lot. And I I, I think you're a, a big golf guy. Um better swing, you or Hassel. Hassel Hassel played competitively through high school. So he's definitely got the better swing. Didn't he play at Muscatine though? Yeah. That's small school. Okay, that barely counts. <laughs> right. He competed enough, but he's got that long, linky, like goofy body that's good for golf. So he's got a pretty good swing in play to watch. He never picks up his clubs. If he actually picked up his clubs and applied himself, he'd have a really good swing. But I'd give the sl- like slightest edge to Chris. Slight. Uh, okay. I just we can't get say too many nice things yeah. about Hassel because his yeah. head gets too big. It's already there. It was just, his head would get even bigger. So a slight backhanded compliment if he plays better yeah. swing. Yeah, I wouldn't have committed to this if it was going to be a hassle love fest. No, no, it absolutely will not be. Um, so you mentioned college football. Obviously, we were a couple weeks away. Yeah. The AP Top 25 came out today, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And if you had, if there's any surprises or just kind of kind of what your thoughts were on that, Nate will pull it up on the main screen here so we can take a look at it. And we also yeah. just want to make sure you – you how many fan bases can you piss off here? With, uh, can I? With talk, yeah, we were talking oh. about the Top 25, just – if you say anybody's too high or too low, I just want you to please piss off as many fan bases as you can. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I can, I can help you out there. Um, just be, look, let's just get one thing straight right out of the gate. I think the AP top 25 poll is meaningless. And I'm one of those people that doesn't even think you should put out rankings until October, until we have an idea of who everyone is. But just looking at the one that was released here on Monday afternoon, I'm not surprised by the top five at all, Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, Texas, Alabama. They obviously think that Alabama's got enough coming back with Kayla DeBoer to throw them back in the in the top five. It's their lowest ranking, by the way, to start the season since 2009, Nick Saban's second year there. So if you're an Alabama fan, you're surprised that you're fit. But I think big picture, a lot of people look at that and say, hey, okay, uh, Alabama back in the top five. I would, I think, I think Notre Dame's getting the benefit of their schedule. Um, I think they're going to be good, but their schedule, aside from USC and opening up with Texas A&M, is one of the easiest in the country. So I think based on schedule, they're probably right where they belong. Michigan and Florida State are the first two teams that I look at that I think are being a little overvalued. Florida State lost a ton from last year's undefeated team, and I think a lot of this ranking, along with Michigan's, is based on what they did a year ago. Michigan's defense is still going to be one of the best in the country. They lose Harbaugh. They lose a lot on offense. There's still a lot of turmoil there. So I think Michigan, Florida State probably overvalued. Uh, Missouri, LSU, undervalued. I think they're going to find their way into the top 10. And then, look, you can pick a couple schools uh, down there. Uh, Texas A&M, I think they're ranked purely based on talent. Uh, USC, remember they were – one of the teams last year that came into the season ranked in the top, they were a playoff team for many people yeah. down there. 23rd is probably right where they belong. So overall, I think a lot of the rankings make sense, but if I had to do overvalued and, and overranked, that's what you want to call it. I, th- I think Michigan, Florida state, probably are the, the two that, that stand out to me. While we have the top 25 up, because this is an Iowa state, this is a big 12 tends to be forward program. Yeah, with the there's five teams that are ranked inside the the top 25 for the Big 12, but the yeah. the highest being Utah at number 12. Yeah, w- w- doing the national show, you guys have to talk about everything. So, what is a perspective from you know Bristol or just the war the, the national media of the Big 12? Because from the inside the conference, it feels like there are like a half a dozen to you know maybe seven or so teams. Where if you said, "Hey, Iowa State's winning the conference," you wouldn't be super shocked. Hey. Right. Kansas State's winning the conference. You wouldn't be super shocked, but there's not really any dominant one teams. Uh, how does that compare to the 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 way that it's viewed from the outside in, as opposed to from us living in Big Twelve country? Well, I'd say the first thing with that is when you look at the Big Ten and the SEC, we can sit there and have a conversation about a college football playoff team in Ohio State and Oregon, even. Penn State, even Michigan, okay? Those are four dominant brands and top-flight teams. You go to the SEC, 
Georgia, Alabama, LSU, same as it ever was, Ole Miss, Missouri. These are teams that are going to compete for a national championship. So now let's forward that over the Big 12. Are there teams that we're looking at in that conference as legitimate national championship contenders? And I think that's the biggest knock on the Big 12 right now. Um, as an Arizona State alum, I'll be the first to say this. I think it's an absolute travesty. The Pac-12 is no longer. I think it, it, it's awful for the sport, but it is what it is. And now those four teams come over into the Big 12. You lose brands like Texas and Oklahoma. Well, you acquired Utah, who's a really, really good football program. I mean, and for those in the Big 12 that don't know, Utah will come in and they will smack you around for four quarters. They're physical. They know who they are. They're going to beat you up front, and they're going to beat you to death for four quarters. That's a good football team. Is it a big brand? No. Colorado, they're not good at football, but they're a big brand right now because of their head coach and, and Deion Sanders. Arizona, breakthrough year a year ago with Jed Fish. Jed goes up to Washington. They bring in a new head coach. The quarterback and the receiver stayed. Not a big brand. And then my alma mater, Arizona State. Back in the day, would compete for Pac-10, Pac-12 championships, but again, not a huge brand. And so I think that's where we are with the Big 12 right now. There's a lot of good programs. There's going to be good football. I've talked to a couple of coaches uh, that have said, win it, like winnable-wise, the Big 12 is one of the most winnable conferences because everybody's kind of in that same area. Look at BYU. BYU is a good – UCF with Gus Malzahn. These are good football schools. I think the Big 12, unfortunately – national landscape doesn't have that a one plant your flag in the ground superstar brand i think that's what makes the conference so fun is that you know, there is there, there isn't an, an alabama georgia lsu someone who you're you know one of those three four teams in the sec is probably going to win the conference right um it's so like jeff mentioned is kind of wide open which i think is great do you think that not to interrupt do you think that it's a two-bid league at all towards because there's 12 teams that we've got to to pull from Assuming that, you know, you look through the, the SEC, you, Texas should get in, Georgia, Alabama should get in. Yeah. Uh, then you have, okay, are we flirting with LS, LSU? You'll get two. Yeah, LS, yep. So then you have uh, Ohio State for sure, not, not for sure, for sure. Oregon kind of for sure, for yeah. sure-ish. So you got like five or six teams that are pretty much already, quote, locks. And then you have an LSU team that you lose, Heisman winner, Top draft, top draft wide receiver, top draft wide receiver, but they're still going to be good. Are they going to be high enough in the SEC? So how many teams come out of the other ones? The Big 12, are they a two-bid league? with? Are they, or are they going to get kind of crowded out by everybody else? Because you get the champion in for sure, guaranteed, yeah. whoever that is. But then who's next? And do they have enough clout to actually you know, impress the national folks to get themselves in? Uh, or is it just, hey, win it and that's it? It's a good question because – we were just talking about a second ago, the, the, the parody of the league would make you think there's going to be a lot of teams hanging around nine and three, 10 and two. Okay. Uh, will that be enough to get two teams in? If some of those teams meet on their schedule, like I'll tell you right now, I think West Virginia and Neil, Bra I think they're going to be a problem. Like West Virginia is a really good football team. And if they get by Penn state, week one. So you need the big 12. And I say this all the time on college football final in the early part of the season, what you need for your league in the big 12, especially because of what we're talking about, they need to win their big out of conference games. If you win your big out of conference games against a Penn state and you get one of these big ones out of league, then yeah, you start stacking up some wins in conference and you've got an 11 and one, or let's call conference champion 12 and one and then a potential 11 and two, 10 and three team that lost in the conference championship, then maybe. But that's the beauty of the 12 team playoff, right? You just, you, you don't know what's going to happen until we play this thing all the way out. I think that's a good point too, because obviously Iowa State plays Iowa. So if Iowa State wins, that'd be great for, you know, for the Big 12. Colorado plays Nebraska, right. which, you know, Nebraska's kind of a dark horse this year. And Colorado, you know, they're, they were shit last year. So who knows how it'll be this year. And then, um, you know, you've got West Virginia, Penn State. Um, now, on your show, Matt, so on, on the Matt Berry show, you had mentioned a few months ago that, um, kind of a hot take, that you thought one of the four new teams in the Big Ten, so either Oregon, UCLA, USC, or Washington, would win the Big Ten. 
And then also that one of the four new Big 12 schools, which I have an assumption of who you're going to say here for the uh, the Big 12, of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State, that one of those four new teams would win the Big 12. Can we dive into that and just, uh, you know, who, I, I'm, I'm assuming maybe Oregon, but yeah, of the Big 10, who are you thinking, you know, could, could potentially knock off Ohio State or come in and just kind of, you know, shake the trees? I think Oregon and Ohio State is going to play for the Big 10 championship. Oregon, here's what I love about Oregon, and I think the one team that's built – like Oregon is Ohio state in that if you look at the way the big 10 is built, what are they known for big offensive linemen running the football, smash it down your throat. I mean, Michigan didn't throw a pass the entire second half of the Penn state game a year ago, but the two teams that were built outside of that mold, Ohio state, because that's what urban built when he was there. And then Oregon, that's who they are. And so you bring that kind of eye candy into this conference who's used to playing football this way, they're going to cause a problem. They were going to win the big, the PAC 12 anyway. I mean, they're, they're loaded. And so I have Oregon in the playoff. I have in the big 10 championship and I would not be the least bit surprised if they, if they beat Ohio state and, and came out of that conference. And then in the big 12, I've just seen the Utah story for too long now. I mean, I remember when they got in, we're sitting there, got into the Pac-12, and we're sitting there, we're like, you know, just wait. I mean, because I saw what they were doing in the Mountain West, you know. It was always them and TCU in the Mountain West that were going at it back and forth. And once Utah got in, it was a matter of time before they started recruiting the kind of depth you needed to be in a Power Five. And so I, Utah, I think, of, of the teams coming in, I put – best chance to win the league. Second, I would put Arizona. They've got the skill position players and they've got enough momentum from last year. And then with the returnees, there's a cluster of teams. They're going to have to look out for these, for these new schools. I I mentioned West Virginia already. I think uh, Kansas state, but Avery Johnson is going to be a really good look. I love Rocco. I love, I mean, I I, look, he's, he's got something to him that Iowa state fans are going to love. And so that they already love. So, when you look at the newcomers, it just works out that they're going to be the favorites. But the the, the incumbents, especially in the Big Ten or in the, in the Big Twelve, are going to need to 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 play really high quality football because it's a brand they're not used to seeing. We uh we felt the wrath of Utah when they were in the Boy, yeah was, uh, Mountain West. Yeah, we we played them in 2010 and they beat us like 63 to 13. There, look, there. I say it about BYU, like. Iowa Iowa's a good example, right? Now we have fun at Iowa's expense because of the lack of offense. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, Cade McNamara's scrimmage uh, <laughs> don't exactly inspire optimism. But Iowa knows who they are, okay? They know what they are. Utah knows what they are. And they're going to win with that. And they'll come into the Big 12, and these teams are going to look around and be like, holy hell. What did, what did we get ourselves into? And it's going to be good for the league because you got to measure up to them. I think what's interesting, you're talking about incumbents, bringing back to the Big Ten, uh, I think Ohio State has the potential to be one of the teams towards the top because they're Ohio State. They have talent. They have, they're they going to have two or three first-round draft picks somewhere, everywhere, all every year. But their quarterback, they brought in Will Howard from yeah. Kansas State. We've seen enough Will Howard that – uh, you're going to get some good, but you're also going to get a lot of bad. He lost a lot of weight, though. Well, I'm good for him. But the <laughs> the thing is, is that like, so the this just the anecdote that comes to mind with Will Howard regarding Ohio State is that like Iowa State plays Kansas State in the snow game last year, which was an absolute blast to watch because it was like watching ten year olds play football because it's just trudging around in snow boots. Uh, but towards the end of the game, he has a negative play chucks his helmet across the bench, starts swearing at his teammates, starts swearing at his coaches. About three days later, he transfers. Like that kind of attitude of screw this, I, you know, I, it's it's he's going to end up swearing at somebody on the sidelines because he messed up. And that, when it's going well, it's just a fiery guy being fiery. If you play Penn State, who's going to have an absolute just rugged defense. If you play Michigan, who has an absolute rugged defense, you got to play Oregon and you got to keep up with that boat race when things start going poorly, and if he's not getting his way, then Ohio State, I'm not going to say they're going to be bad, but they might not win the games that they always win just because they don't have 
a stud quarterback, studded quarterback like a CJ Stroud, they have Will Howard. And I'm I'm really interested to see what Ryan Day does with a guy like him, because if he can keep him on the rails, you get more good than bad. But if you can't keep him on the rails, you're going to get a lot of upturned apple carts, and that is going to lead to a lot more frustration in the magnifying glass that is Buckeye Stadium. Yeah, I don't even know. I mean, I guess we assume Will Howard's the guy, but, I mean, we don't know that. I mean, Devin Brown returns. If he didn't get it, he'll probably transfer. Julian Sayan was the number one ranked quarterback in his class. He transferred in from Alabama. I mean, I guess he's the guy. I can tell you this. I mean, with what I'm hearing about this true freshman receiver that they have, the Jonathan Smith, I believe, and with Quinchon Judkins coming in, Travion Henderson coming back, uh, Emeka Buka coming back. Like, your job, dude, is just don't screw it up. And I, I – Look, I don't think, and and this is just because historically I think we can use this as a barometer, I don't think Chip Kelly and Ryan Day are going to screw this up at quarterback. I just – and I'm with you. Kyle McCord was was really good. He just couldn't beat Michigan. And that chased him out of town. Is Will Howard an upgrade from Kyle McCord? I mean, I don't think so. But, again – I don't think that those two coaches with that offensive acumen that they have are going to screw this up. It'll be interesting to see what they do. And yeah, Goodwill Howard's good. I mean, I don't know. That, that To me, that's one of the biggest things because I've said it, and I believe it, even more than Georgia, I think Ohio State's the most talented team in the country, period. And the one position we look at is quarterback and, and, and how will that manifest itself throughout the season, you know, we're about to find out. To me, it feels like uh, almost like a Purdy type situation where he's got just he's lo- loaded with just talent. Don't screw it up. Yeah, just loaded with talent. Purdy is obviously a good quarterback. Well, Will Howard's a good quarterback as well too. So I think it's just like you kind of said, Matt. Just don't don't screw it up and get the ball into the playmaker's hands. That's it. Uh, do, do you think that Ohio State? I guess kind of what we're talking about Ohio State. It's not an Ohio State show, but do you think they're good enough to to win the national championship? Or who yes. do you think are your favorites? You know, to to take home the national championship? Yeah, I think they're I think they're every bit good enough to, to win the national championship. George is always going to stop and start the conversation with Georgia. They're always going to be good enough to win the national championship. Kalen DeBoer took Washington in two years to a national championship game. You give him Alabama's parts. I mean, is anyone counting out Alabama? You know, cause I'm not. And you have to look big picture with teams that don't always get the opportunity that are now getting the opportunity. A team that I think that is finally going to get over the hump. I think Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss, our team, people pay attention because it's Lane Kiffin. But if you look at his transfer portal hall and what they have coming back, they're the kind of team you want nothing to do with in a college football playoff situation. 10-2 and two gets you in. I really believe that. 10-2 and two in the SEC gets you in. If they're 10-2, and two, I think they could go on a little bit of a run. The Big Ten, Oregon, Ohio State, Penn State and their annual 10 and 2 record because they can't beat Ohio State and Michigan. Is that good enough to win a national championship? I don't know. I mean, down in the ACC, Clemson, probably not. Cam Ward, is he good enough at Miami to lead them to special things? I've gone on record as saying I think Virginia Tech's a playoff sleeper. I think they can get in. And so outside of those big four that we always talk about, I think it's a wide open year. And this is actually the perfect year for a 12-team playoff. When you look at, like, here's a team for you. We can get real into the college football weeds if you want. The highest-ranked group of five. Memphis is going to be a problem for people. Iowa State played them in the bowl game last year. Their quarterback's good. good. They're good. And so you just get the right team with the right matchup at the right time. I mean, who knows what's going to happen. I'm just glad that it's wide open because I think everybody – in the top four, five, six has a couple of things they need to address. So there isn't, in my mind, one dominant overall team that's going to be like, yep, that that's your national champion. I think one thing that's really cool about this 12-team playoff, and I just really like the way that it's set up, just generally. Now, granted, the the big the Big Ten SEC, they're going to get 85% of the teams in there. Do they deserve it? Probably, maybe, maybe not, depending on how everything goes. We'll see as the cards shake out. But one of the things that I really like if it's Manhattan, if it's Ames, if it's Salt Lake City, hosting a playoff game, especially in, uh, I mean, Ohio State, Michigan, un- especially way in the north, when it's going to be 20 degrees oh, yeah. as a high, 
in the middle of December and you got to bring Alabama, if let's say Alabama doesn't win the SEC and they're the six seed or whatever it breaks out to be, and they got to play the next highest ranked uh, champ, conference champion. Let's say that's Kansas State. Let's say that's Iowa State. You got to come to Ames when it's 15 degrees and you got to win a playoff game in the most bananas environment that has ever existed north of the Mason Dixon. And that is a game you have to win to go to the playoffs or to, to go to advance in the playoff. I think that's a really cool part of it is being able to host the first round playoff games, especially, you know, the teams like an Iowa State, a Kansas State, and a Utah, whoever is going to end up winning the Big 12. Yeah. That to me feels like a really cool opportunity for an upset of one of those big teams that aren't going to win the conference that have to play their way through. That's the best part. I mean, people ask all the time, but he was excited for this season. Well, it's the home playoff games. I mean, and you're right. That's why we were laughing when USC started the exit from the comfy confines of the Pacific coast to the big 10. It's like, all right, dude, if you want to go play in happy Valley in, in December, you don't <laughs> leave 70 degree weather, but if that's what you want go ahead. Like if that's what you really want to do, have at it. And that's that you look, we have fun with the regionality and the lack thereof now in, in the realignment just because we always have fun with, oh, UCLA at Rutgers. That makes a lot of sense. We're not even talking about it at the end of the season for that very thing. Some of these West Coast teams going to places where they don't play. Some of these teams that are in Florida having to go different areas of the country. And so come playoff time, we see it in the NFL, right? Weather. You see a team that's – no one wants to go to Green Bay in January. Well, there's a reason for that because you get there and you're not going to win. And so I, I, this to me, done right and seated in a way that could cause some problems. I mean, there's teams that are, we were looking at the rankings a second ago. There's teams that aren't ranked here in the top 25. Virginia Tech's one of them. Boise State, they're a group of five you got to look at. We were talking about Louisville before we came on. I mean, they're – there are teams out there that could, if they get in and something went their way, it, it, it's it's going to be fun to watch, especially that campus atmosphere for the first time in the playoff game. And that's kind of what I want to ask you too. I'm, I'm glad you led into that was, you know, of the teams that aren't in the top 25, are there any teams you think could, you know, I feel like every year there's a team that's not in the top 25 that sneaks yeah. into the top 10 or is like a, you know, a program that's like, oh, you know, where'd they come from? And I want to ask you if there's any teams. Other know. than Virginia Tech. We'll take Virginia Tech off the table. Virginia Tech's off the table. I mentioned Memphis. They got, you know, they got 16 votes in this. Iowa State, you guys know, look, Iowa State with Matt Campbell, they, they, they flirt with being a solid top 20 program every year. They're just on the outside. Um, I look down at Kentucky. Like, look at, no one respects Kentucky ever. And all Mark Stoops does there is win. Yeah. The Texas A&M disaster he came back. He's back. Look, they bring in a talented kid that was highly recruited at quarterback from Georgia. He comes in to play. You know Kentucky's going to play defense. They got three votes. Like, yeah. they're a team that can find their way into the top 25. And so they're, they're West Virginia, they got 17 votes. I would bet, looking at this not-ranked list, one, two, three, four – Five, six, I can see seven teams that aren't ranked right now being ranked by the end of the year. Iowa State being one of them. That's right. God, yeah. that's Matt Campbell. Going yeah, down to two, do it. I, I mean, I, it's just, it's, again, I, I started off by saying preseason AP poll is, is worth nothing. But if anything, it's worth something. We can go back and say, hey, look, they got it right. Yeah. The uh, So talking about just kind of campus environment, we had someone from Arizona on. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Jason Shear from Arizona on, and he was talking about he like kind of openly admitted one of the things that's exciting for Arizona fans about coming to the Big Twelve is having like a super pumped up environment pretty much every single week. Uh, to flip that question, when because I don't think Iowa State does, Iowa State doesn't go to Tempe, right? Uh, we don't play Arizona State yeah. this year. So like when teams do go to Tempe as an ASU grad. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the environment that you're kind of expecting this year? Because it's a move and yeah. it's also Tempe, which beautiful. I mean, the best great place we played in the bowl game in 2009, the insight bowl. Uh, I'm going to side rail my own question. 
How is Arizona State with that campus not the best at every sport every year? Don't get me started. I don't have enough time. I'm in a good mood. I don't want to be <laughs> angry. I don't want to get into the how is Arizona State not run college athletics because they should. Because it is the best place to go from a scenery perspective, from a weather perspective. I mean, like we could go hours on that. Yeah, it's beautiful. I said UCLA and Arizona State. I don't know why they just don't win everything between those two. But anyway. Ames, Iowa is right there too. But, uh, it's a beautiful campus, but uh, not quite same. Not quite January. <laughs> uh, so when with Arizona State, what do you, environment-wise, do you expect? Is it going to be a we'll see what happens kind of year, or are they going to be all in on kind of generating some momentum for this team? Yeah, there's going to be some intrigue. I think, I, look, I, I'll say this. The, the addition of those four teams to the Big 12, when you look at, at regional – additions that made the most sense Colorado Utah Arizona Arizona State that makes sense in the Big 12 it, it just does like that regionally makes sense now the teams they added to survive a few years ago Cincinnati West Virginia UCF BYU BYU fits I, I think we could argue about the rest of them but as far as I think people at Arizona State they're, they're, there's going to be a lot of curiosity of because it's a new exciting schedule right is Arizona State Sun Devil you grew up every year new and you were playing USC UCLA Washington you, you knew your schedule, whether it was going to be home or away. Now you get teams coming in that you've never seen before. That makes it fun. Um, ASU, that look, your Tempe is, is, a, is a city in, in, in the Valley where there's Phoenix, there's pro sports, there's, there's a lot going on. And so ASU has been one of those places. If you win, there's nothing like it. And so for Kenny Dillingham, second-year head coach, generating excitement, showing people that, it's on the right track. Big 12 fans, I would encourage you and tell you, if you have ASU on your schedule this year, make the trip. Go. Just, you just just go. Because it will be fun. Now, when I went there, the stadium, Sun Devil Stadium was still 73,000 plus seats. They did a whole renovation. I think they knocked it down to maybe 48, 50,000. So it's a much more intimate stadium. So theoretically – more intimate if it sells out it's going to be loud better than the, the open stands and so it's going to be good for the conference to see tempe and to see arizona state so i i would definitely go it's it's tucked between those two are they considered mountains yeah it, it gets loud I mean, it gets loud in there we didn't have like a ton of people at our bowl game but it was loud there because just kind of everything reverberated around um I, you have anything else for football's gonna pivot you go ahead okay uh i was gonna pivot to uh to, to golf so now matt you correct me if i'm wrong here have you called the Masters and uh, the championship, PGA Championship before? Some, yes. Some comment. I, yes. I want to ask you. Yeah. I want to ask you if uh, like what were some of your favorite moments, like most memorable moments from uh, any of those tournaments that you've called? Well, two of them, you know, we when we go there, you know, it's, I've been to the Masters, I think, 12 or 13 times. And every time oh, you go, know, it's, it's, it's new every time. It's like, it's like stepping on the, the place brand new again. For me – I mean, Tiger Woods in 2019, uh, when we were there, uh, being able to do Sports Center from there was just, I mean, you kind of had an idea going into the week. We knew he was healthy. He was kind of, I tell people this story, when he was walking around, because we have access to, to pretty much everywhere there on the ground, and he was kind of peacocking. Like, he was kind of strutting, like, and we're like, oh, shit, Tiger's got some some swagger to him this week. And we kind of had an idea that he was going to compete, and then to to do it the way that he did to me was, was one of the great comeback stories in all of sports. And then I was at Kiowa when Phil won. And oh, so you're so talking two of the best wins, right? So you're, you're talking about two all time, great golf victories for guys that I grew up watching. And one of them being an Arizona state Sun Devil and Phil Mickelson. And so yeah, those two, I mean, and you just, you'll never forget it. You'll never forget the week each day, how they were stacking up on top of each other, waking up at 5 a.m. to be on TV at 7 a.m. You know, you just, you look like, you, your eyes are, like, you just look like garbage, but you're going on TV talking about Phil Mickelson, Tiger Woods trying to make history, and I'll, I'll never forget it. It was just absolutely incredible. With that Tiger in 2019, you said you were at the anchor desk. Did you get, were you in the, just the kind of production booth with that or at the desk, or were you able to follow around on the course? I stay, I don't, I don't go out, out okay. as much just cause you, like you, you've got to be where you are. Um, 
but it, that's probably you can you can hear roars everywhere in that place yeah and I just was, know that you were there i was just like i in that one i always go back to amen corner on 12 when it was Molinari and Finau, I think yeah. were the two that he was paired with and both of them plunk it in the water. And you know that it was just because they were standing on the tee box with Tiger Woods making a charge. Like, could you feel that? Because I imagine the energy that exists around Tiger, like I've been around a few really good. So Iowa State wrestlers, uh, you have Dan Gable yeah. um, and then you have Kale Sanderson. And I, I went and watched Kale Sanderson wrestle, you know, undefeated, never lost at all in college. And when you watch, when you're just around Kale, it was like, this dude's winning everything. And you just have to, you, you can feel it off of him. Is that the same thing that you get even just from the the booth or your desk that you could just feel Tiger on 12, just say, everybody get out of the way. This is my tournament. Yeah, look, he's got an aura to him. I think unlike anything we've seen, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, comes to mind a lot, but that was a team sport, but you knew Michael could take over a team sport. Tiger in his heyday on a Sunday, if he had the lead, in his red walking down the driving range, it was like Darth Vader. Like you were just, you were, you were dead and you knew it. Like you weren't going to do anything about it. There was nothing you could do about it. Well, fast forward to 2019. We hadn't seen that. It had been years. He had all the back fusions and he had all the issues. We hadn't seen it. And so none of those guys respectively had been in a moment with peak tiger. And back in his heyday, tiger was good for three shots with his opponents just for that that they're standing next to Tiger and they're overthinking the room. I mean, it's, you just can't convince me that they didn't know to put the ball in the center of the green with an eight iron on the Sunday. You didn't need to do anything else. Yeah. Water, water, Kepka had a miss hit. And then all of a sudden what happens is Tiger is like, well, these idiots, I'm going to put it to the center of the green. What do you do? Center of the green. Because he knew that he cost him a stroke. And then you fast forward to the par five, thir- no, the par five, 15th. Where Molinari hits his second shot, tree branch got too aggressive, knocks it in the water. And then you get to the 16th. So now they're giving up all these shots. Tiger gets out of there. You go to the par three 16th, and he knows what to hit that shot, that traditional Sunday pin placement upper left. So you hit the ball upper right side of the green. It hits the ridge. It's going to go down the hole. Well, what do you do? He did just that, and that's the shot that really won in the tournament. And so no one in history – I mean, he could draw Augusta National on a napkin with his bl- eyes blindfolded. That's uh-huh. why we always said if he was going to win another one, it would be at Augusta. And the intimidation factor, you like, he, I tell everyone this. When I go to the Masters every single year, Tiger's made it a habit now to show up on Sunday nights. You don't have to see him physically to know that he arrived. There's a hum, there's a buzz, there's human movement, and it's like, oh shit, Tiger's here. And then 10 minutes later, you see him on the range. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. That's awesome. Man, and and I just I, I'm a huge golf nut. Yeah. Uh so when I I was watching the the tournament with Kiowa when I was actually in Savannah, Georgia. So like you're still sort of feeling the same conditions because Kiowa and Savannah aren't that too far apart. Uh and you just feel the wind off the ocean. And I would imagine Phil, when he's in killer mode, Phil has sort of the same thing because i think it was brooks that he was paired with right it was brooks and phil it was brooks or bryson i don't remember who it was that was that was either i was in the competition with him because that was the start of the brooks bryson uh mm-hmm. Br- Br- bryson walking behind him brooks yeah. it was that was the same that tournament was where it started but like i imagine that same thing of like like it, it's it was probably less expected because tiger is tiger but phil had been out of it for a while as far it as like competition it's- Right. And then all of a sudden, I would imagine that was less of like, oh, Tiger's here. It's more of like, wait, Phil's on four. He's he's where? Like, what was that day like if you're just experiencing Phil get himself to the top of that leaderboard? Candidly, every then this truth, every night we, you know, we'd be wrapping up and we'd be getting ready for the stuff in the morning. And we're like off off camera. We were like, how long does it take Phil to fall off the lead? No chance Phil's on the lead at the end of the day. Like we were just waiting for the inevitable, like Phil's not going to be leading. And then end of the day, because it's a contention, end of the day, we're like, oh, he's not going anywhere. And so, you know, this was obviously pre-live. And so he had the goodwill still of the, the golfing world. And it went down at the time. I mean, you, you could argue 86 Jack at Augusta, but Phil, I think, was 51 when he won it. And he's going against all these dudes in their prime. 
is and that it, course is 7,600 yards. It, right. Like, the, the course, the conditions. I mean, during a practice round, on, I think it was on the, was it the 16th, 17th? One of the two, they were hitting driver off the tee, driver off the deck because it was into the wind. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was just, it was wild. He had that bunker shot early in his final round. It's like, oh, Phil's going to do this. And when you really think about it, and that's what I say about golf all the time, it's the one sport where you can actually see legends of the game play against the stars of the game and the legends sometimes still win. And you can't say that in any other sport. No 50 year old in the NBA, no 50 year old in the NFL can compete. But here we are in golf, two of the all time greats beating up the 23 year olds that were at the height of their powers. Now, were you at this, uh, the most recent U S open, the, the Rory, uh, Bryson, uh, -uh. Oh, I wonder I just on the, the negative side, just, I, again, golf storylines as of this is now as a professional, how do you cover that fairly to Rory when the, it's the one on 16 where he yep. misses a three footer, three -footer then he misses another three footer on 18, then ditches the media, but understandably ditches the media because of the three footer on 16 and the three footer on 18. Is there just something you kind of intuitively understand about how you need to cover that? Or do you, do you consciously say, Hey, Rory face the music or like, how do you handle that as a professional? Cause I imagine you're coming on sports center round is over. And now we cut live to sports center. I mean, how do you cover that event when something happens like that? And he, the wheels fall off so hard. Yeah. I mean, our job is just to show the highlight and document what happened. Um, and I've never been, I don't blame Rory for leaving. Like the media gets really, really angry when they get blown off. I mean, the guy's been dealing with this now for how long? He hasn't won a major since 2014. So 10 years. And he's had some slit, like the U.S. Open last year at L.A. Country. Like he's had these chances to win and they just slip through. And look, if you, none of us are in that cauldron of world-class pressure on the biggest stage. I mean, I'd probably leave too. And, you know, our job is to show the highlight, give the post round reaction. You know, we have Andy North and Curtis Strange, really great golf legends, two time U.S. Open winners. When we are doing our tournaments that are there to provide perspective, Jeff Ogilvie's on our team now. And so, you know, we don't have the U.S. Open on ESPN, but we have the guys there covering it. And their job is to tell you what happened. And flat out, Rory missed putts. He just missed putts and Bryson didn't. You know, look, Bryson's a killer, okay? They're, the Tiger's a killer. To win major championships, you have to be a killer. And Rory was once a killer. I mean, he was. And I don't know what's happened recently, but I'm ne I've never been one of those guys that's like, oh, he blew off the media, what a prick. I don't blame him. Like, I'd have been angry too. Yeah, I don't know how you get a good response after that. Okay, I feel like I can see the floor with golf questions, but I could ask, an, I could ask two more hours of golf questions. Golf player, right. <laughs> well, I'll add one more question for him regarding, and that's regarding Hassel. You know, obviously we we know Hassel pretty well, and 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 Couture and his admiration for loose meat sandwiches. I want to ask you, how much does Hassel pay you to be his friend? The payment stuff, like uh, he's used to try to do Venmo, like bro, I'm a cash guy. Like I don't want any <laughs> digital transaction of me you paying me for our friendship. Uh, we we actually um, we started at ESPN at the exact same time in 2013. He was there January 2013. I got there into February, early March. And at the time, we had this, the same agent. And so our agents our agents say, hey, you two, you know, should get together. You started the ESPN at the same time. I was coming from Dallas. I had worked there for five years at the NBC station. And I'm like, all right, man, I'll, I'll go hang out with this goofy dude from Iowa, whatever. Like, I, you know, we don't know anybody. We need friends. The wives need to meet someone. And the wives, our wives, Kristen and Ashley, ended up just hitting it off famously. And Chris and I kind of had opposite schedules at first. We'd work together sometimes, but we were always working. So then the wives would hang out while we were at work because everyone was new. And then it ended up just being a, a great friendship. And, and, and really, the friendship took off right at the end of Chris's time at ESPN in 2017. But then they moved down to Florida my wife's job moves to Florida and the relationship continues in Florida. And now we always laugh. We're going on a, a decade plus of payments from Hassel to be his friend. So <laughs> a lot of money off that guy. 
That's great. That's probably, I mean, that, that just, that just funds all the travel to and from Florida. That's what it is. That's it. Like, right. It pays for the, my, my private jet to Florida while he's flying jet blue. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's great. I think I got, I mean, we, you've already given us enough of your time. I mean, I sincerely appreciate hopping on and uh, time, guys, you bet. Yeah. We're so excited let's, to have ACU in. I'll turn, I'll turn to the interviewer real quick. Who do you have winning the big 12 in its new season? Um, to me, I feel like it's there's there's Utah has to be number one just because if Cam Rising stays healthy the entire year, they have to be the team to beat. But that if still lingers because he hasn't played a full season since what's 2022, 2021, maybe because he missed uh, the Super Bowl two years ago. So that's Utah has to be number one, but that's a big asterisk. Uh, Kansas State, based on Chris Kleiman, and as uh, he has enough championship pedigree that pretty much no matter what happens, he deserves the benefit of the doubt. And yeah. then I feel like you have to, I mean, a little bit biased. Iowa State is the most experienced team based on returning production in the entire country. Right. You have your top four wide receivers at top three at wide receiver, top tight end, two top running backs, your returning quarterback, all five offensive linemen. And you add... And you and NFL talented lineman at left tackle. You add uh, the Princeton tra uh, Princeton transfer is probably a top three round draft pick in, at offensive line. You have your entire defense sans, I believe, uh, TJ Tampa as a graduate, and there's one other. Uh, it's uh, Gary Vaughn is a missing linebacker. So you yeah. return at least nine starters on defense. You return ten out of eleven starters on offense, and that team is going to be pretty good. So to me, it feels like it's Utah, Kansas State, and then Iowa State being kind of the wild card just because of production experience. But I don't know. It's a little bit biased on that third one. But I love it. Four teams. Four teams. I'll, I'll, I'll lean away from Iowa State because I, I feel like Iowa State has a, has a shot, but I also think that it's so wide open. Um, I I think Utah is, because they're scheduled and because they are good, I absolutely despise Kansas State, so I can't say Kansas State. Um, they're also replaced. I think Kansas State's replacing four or five offensive linemen, which is tough. That's tough to replace. And I am not sold that Avery Johnson's a good quarterback. I think he's a glorified running back who can – you know, throw it like Uncle Rico. Um, I, That's one of us. I, one of us taking that stance. Just put that publicly. It, well, I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna say UCF might be kind of the the dark they're horse of the conference. Yep. That that they're a sleeper, and and I think that if there's if Utah is undefeated when they go to Orlando um, in November, I think that could be a game that UCF upsets them. Um, yeah. So I think. Yeah, I mean, again, we we just keep rattling off teams. So so yeah. you have. So look, Utah's the the class. They're you know again it depends on on Cam, and I like I there's something about West Virginia. Keep an eye on the yep. Mountaineers. Throw them in the mix. And Green as he's another guy because so their offense runs so thoroughly. It's sort of I mean not saying it's the same class, but Jaden Daniels at LSU. That offense runs so firmly through him at quarterback that if he's healthy all the way through the season carry it but he is such a running quarterback i think he sprained an ankle midway through last year and had to miss like two or three games and they lost both of the two of the three games that he lost so like west virginia because they have a running quarterback in kansas state a little bit too they have that can he keep himself healthy with the amount of hits that he's going to take in order for that offense to chug along but i agree with you i mean if he is able to stay healthy they do they also is it zach frederick is the center that they lost i blew out everything in his knee i, I forget the name of the center but he, they lost their center to the NFL. He was like a second-round draft pick, even though he had no ligaments in his knee. But mm -hmm. they lose him, and they have a quarterback that's uh, very run-heavy. But controlling those two ifs, West Virginia is dirty. I'm, UCF is dirty. We also haven't even talked about you know, Arizona. Or who, Kansas. Ar or Kansas. Arizona's got a very favorable, very favorable schedule. And then there's also Kansas, that if Jalen Daniels can stay healthy. There's, yeah. So then look at look what we did here. I mean, we talked about <laughs> yeah. that means the Big 12 is going to be amazing. Yeah, I'm just I'm excited. You know, we're a couple weeks away. I'm excited for the season to get here, and it's so wide open that I I think I think we're all in agreement that Utah has the target on their back. But I think who they're going to play in the championship game, I think that's wide open, and I think it's going to be make for a great season. Well, we'll, uh, we'll do a postseason recap with you guys. We'll see how we all ended up. That'd be great, hundred percent. We appreciate time. Season, you bet anytime. Thanks, Matt. Thanks again, Matt. You bet. That is uh, the worldwide leaders, Matt Barry, ASU alumnus. That was fun, man. I do. I could, I legit could probably talk about golf and golf broadcasting. When I said two hours, I'm not kidding. To just ask about what it's like to be there, I am such a nut, I'm such a golf nut. Yeah, yeah. No, and he's. I mean, 
obviously he has to face his job, just a wealth of knowledge of, of all sports. Um, but just hearing hearing some of the stories and like you said, I feel like we could have gone down like hours of stories of multiple people of, of Tiger, of Phil, of Bryson, of yeah. Rory, of I mean shit, he worked with Curtis Strange. Like that dude's got a crazy history too. I, yeah. This uh I really appreciate him coming on. That was, yeah, that was, that was really awesome. Fun. And if he said, I mean, he he opened the door. We're gonna keep that door up. If he said, Hey, a postseason recap of who we predicted, that's gonna happen. I mean, if he's down for it. Yeah, that's gonna happen. We're holding people to the fire. We got someone we got, coming on next week. That we, uh, said, I'll we, be back. Yeah, and, we got a, a recurring guest, a fun a, recurring guest. He's a big fan of the show. We had ESPN this week. We got Fox next week. Ooh, Fox Sports. Rattle me. Yeesh. So, you got anything else, Jeff? No. All right, that is all I got. Thank you to all of our loyal listeners who are still listening. And as always, remember, adopt. Don't shop.